catastrophic fire guts the Notre Dame Cathedral, a symbol of beauty, culture, and history in Paris, scarred. What was lost and the promise to rebuild. Alberta is ready to vote and we are here in battleground Calgary. Our province is hurting big time. Jobs, the economy, and of course pipelines. What's at stake for the province? And yes, for the rest of Canada. A developing story in BC. Four people are dead after a shooting spree in a small city. But what was the motive? This is The National. A thick plume of smoke filled the Paris sky today, a devastating sight as the Notre Dame Cathedral was consumed by flames, smoldering still hours later. The majestic structure dates back more than eight centuries, a crowning attraction in a tourist mecca. For Christians, especially Roman Catholics, the loss deeply felt on this Easter Holy Week. Until today, Notre Dame de Paris was one of the world's great cathedrals, a place of pilgrimage and prayer for the faithful, but also revered for the beauty of its proportions, the genius of its design, and a setting that breathes history. It sits on an island in the River Seine, in the heart of central Paris, walking distance from other landmarks, drawing millions every year. Today, Parisians watched in shock as one of their treasures burned and crumbled. Thomas Dagla takes us through a shattering day. Hellish. A cathedral that stood for 800 years brought to its knees in just over an hour. Notre Dame, the symbol of medieval Paris, known to draw huge crowds year round, but not like this. Everyone here is stunned. And just, as you can see around me, people are just watching. Even the cruise ships are just waiting and watching in shock. Hundreds of firefighters battled in precarious conditions, facing relentless flames, and the sight of history going up in smoke. This is a catastrophe, said Notre Dame's rector, Patrick Chauvet. I'm very upset. All I can do is pray. The cathedral's towering spire, famous in its own right, went down to the sound of disbelief. It's unbearably sad, he says. This is France that's being lost. Paris is all, Paris is crying now, not just me. Investigators suspect it was all an accident as Notre Dame undergoes multi-million dollar restoration work. Just days ago, crews removed priceless statues from above, unknowingly saving them before the roof was destroyed. The French president met with first responders and emerged tonight with a promise. We will rebuild this cathedral all together, said Emmanuel Macron. It's part of France's destiny. Crowds cheered on firefighters for having saved what they could. Those two famous towers are still standing. Crews used flashlights to search for damage well into the night. But how much has been lost? The answer might be just as jarring as the sight of this giant gutted. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, London. And let's take you to the scene of that fire now. Radio Canada's Jean-Francois Belanger is outside the cathedral. And Jean-Francois, what are you seeing there tonight? And it's been hours and we can uh, still smell the smoke. Uh, we can still see ash falling down from the sky. And there's still hundreds of firefighters hard at work trying to contain the blaze. Uh, there's, they've uh, hosing down the cathedral uh, from adjacent buildings. Now we're told that the worst has been avoided. We don't see any more uh, flames raising from the sky. Uh, from the building, but they're going to be hard at work for the, from the, for the remainder of the night, that's for sure. You know, we got a sense through the day of how devastating this was for Parisians, but you're in the city. Tell us more about the mood of the people. 
It's in the middle of the night here, Ian, but there's still hundreds of people gathered around here, uh, faithful that are praying, uh, singing religious songs. You know, Ian, uh, the Cathedral Notre Dame is really uh, close to the heart of not only Parisians, but all the French people for, of course, religious reasons, uh, spiritual reasons, but also for cultural reasons. Uh, all roads lead uh, to Paris. All French roads re lead to, to Paris. The uh, kilometer zero is in front of uh, Notre Dame Cathedral. So it's really dear to the heart of all the French and of course it will re be rebuilt that's uh, that's what the pre president uh, Emmanuel Macron promised everyone tonight all right Jean-Francois Berlanger in Paris tonight thank you a pleasure the magnitude of loss is huge not only is the skyline now changed so much history went up in flames Friar Stewart looks at the treasures that lived within the Notre Dame Cathedral and what it stood witness to over the centuries <laughs> For centuries, Notre Dame has towered over Paris, a medieval holy site. Its Gothic architecture, a backdrop to history. Napoleon was crowned emperor here. Its bells mark Paris's liberation during the Second World War, and crowds gathered in front to celebrate. So in the history of architecture, it's hugely important. But it's also one of those buildings that's really embedded itself in our culture, in our in our. Western imagination. Notre Dame holds an unmistakable allure. It's renowned for its flying buttresses and stained glass rose windows and inspired Victor Hugo's novel, The Hunchback of Notre Dame. This art historian studies the cathedral and has even climbed it. She says much of the building's original contents were destroyed during the French Revolution, but it still housed several religious relics and pieces of art. It's a huge loss. In terms of what we can learn about the past, it's a loss because every little thing that still remains today is really precious. This is what the altar looks like now. Some good news, it appears the crown of thorns, said to have been worn by Jesus Christ while he was crucified, was saved from the fire. Crews also battled to try to save the iconic bell towers. The bells inside were replaced in 2013 to mark the 850th anniversary of the cathedral. But for Matthew Whitfield, it was Notre Dame's two organs that left him awestruck. He visited the cathedral because he wanted to hear them for himself. It's an entirely different experience being surrounded by that grandeur and the uh, density of sound that these instruments produce. It was truly extraordinary. Even though officials say the cathedral structure has been saved, the sense of loss is still profound. Higher and higher it goes, reaching up. Because while it's withstood wars and revolutions and been repaired before, it's not yet clear just how devastating this fire has been. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. That sense of loss was also felt by the crowd gathered outside the cathedral. A spontaneous moment of song and prayer. We'll have more from those gathered in our moment later in the hour. For now, let's go to Alberta and Rosemary, you're in Calgary again for us tonight. That's right, Ian. Tomorrow is election day, of course, in this province, and polls open in just hours from now. We are here in Calgary, a key battleground, the choice for voters, four more years of an NDP government, or a return to the tradition of a Conservative premier. Both main contenders say that after 28 days of contentious campaigning, the options are clear. Just one more sleep. <laughs> One more day before Albertans have an opportunity to vote for change that gets our province back to work and that gets Alberta back on track. I ask again, as I did at the outset, who do you trust to fight for you? NDP leader Rachel Notley spent part of this last day campaigning here in Calgary. Her main rival, Jason Kenney, of the United Conservative Party, focused on Edmonton. But no matter where you go, at the heart of that decision for so many Albertans, their bottom lines. Alberta has been rocked by collapsing oil prices. The Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion project is on hold. And more than 170,000 people here are looking for jobs with no luck. Jobs, the economy, and pipelines, right? Jobs, the economy, and pipelines. We can build the economy, 
we can create jobs and we can do that while still supporting health care and education. So on the eve of such a crucial decision, our focus tonight, what's at stake for Albertans and yes, the rest of Canada. How voters feel about their options in this election may depend a whole lot on where they live. The issues, of course, play differently for rural and urban voters. But as Carolyn Dunn explains, there is one thing just about everyone can agree on. They don't like the tone of this whole campaign. At the Chuck Wagon Cafe in Turner Valley, they'll make you a farm-to-table breakfast with a side of politics. Our province is hurting big time. I don't believe that this current government has been um, that favorable towards oil and gas. I think consistently the one thing everybody wants is people to go back to work. You know, people to be able to afford their mortgages comfortably, people being able to put their kids in camp. The economy is dominating this campaign. For voters who want change, Jason Kenney's promises are resonating. But that issue is playing differently in Edmonton, where Rachel Notley has strong support. The reality is, is everybody inherited this current economy and somebody had to do something. And stimulus spending has always been proven to be a far more um, beneficial way of getting out of it. I'm going to choose the party that I think is going to provide the most support for the most amount of people and so for me that's the NDP. Those polarized views have led to an incredibly negative campaign. The reason campaigns go negative is because negative campaigning is 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 quite effective, right? Um, negative news catches your eye. But it can be exhausting. In this coffee shop in Battleground, Calgary, they set up cardboard cutouts of the front-running leaders. The election is pretty serious for a lot of people and uh, gets a little heated at times, so why not have a bit of fun with it? Betty Hegarit was happy to voice her priorities to the leaders, cardboard or not. I'm very concerned about education, about the quality of education. I have someone in my family who is gay, so gay rights are very important to me. And Phil Ponting has advice for the winner whomever that is. Consider what all Albertans and all Calgarians think needs to be done. Not dogmatically, but pragmatically. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. We are tonight in the riding of Calgary Buffalo. It is right in the heart of a city that has a history of picking the party that wins. They've done it in every provincial election since 1948. About a quarter of the seats in Alberta's legislature are from Calgary. And those broad issues the province is facing right now are very personal to voters here. The unemployment rate is the second highest of any major city in Canada. A quarter of the office buildings sit empty. Nahed Nenshi is Calgary's mayor, and I spoke with him earlier about how important this whole vote is for his city. So, Mayor, how has this election been for a mayor of uh, Alberta's biggest city? What, how have you felt about this? Uh, frustrated more than anything else, um, because we this election has been about many things, and many things that we should talk about. We should be talking about social issues. We should be talking about how the world is changing. But there really hasn't been a lot of vetting of the economic plans of, this, of the parties, and that's what bugs me. So you look at those beautiful buildings and that gorgeous skyline, one out of four of them is empty right now, meaning that small businesses across the city are being faced with crushing property tax increases. People always forget that the property tax isn't just a city tax, it's also a provincial tax. And I really haven't seen from any of the parties a real economic plan that helps create jobs, that helps return Calgary to its place even though Calgary is so important for winning an election, they haven't come up with a plan to deal with exactly what you're talking about. You know, I love politics, right? But I love politics when it's about stuff. And so, you know, Premier Notley has spent most of the campaign in Calgary. Um, Mr. Kenny has spent a ton of the campaign in Calgary. This is the first provincial campaign where none of the party leaders came to see the mayor, which I find odd. But despite all that, we're not really talking about what we can do. You know, Mr. Kenny wants to reduce corporate taxes yeah. over four years. Yeah. It's going to create a bunch of jobs, Laffer Curve stuff. Premier Notley uh, thinks that we're going to create a whole bunch of diversified green energy jobs and so on. Both of those are fine in theory. Mm -hmm. Neither of them helps the dry cleaner who's going out of business this week. Would you, and that's yeah. what we have to focus Would on. Would you agree, though, just to the people that I've been talking to over the past day or so, nobody thinks anybody can solve all these things. Well, here's the issue, right? Neither of these parties, I should say none of them, because there are five parties, none of these parties are going to get the Trans Mountain Pipeline built five minutes earlier than any other party. 
Some of them might get it built slower, as a matter of fact, um, if they overplay their cards. But I'm not sure that the average voter has really engaged at that level. Because I think a lot of people think either once we re-elect, you know, the NDP and the UCP kind of goes away, we'll be a golden economic age. A lot of other people think as soon as you elect the UCP and get rid of the NDP, yeah. the honey will flow. Yeah. Neither of those things is going to happen. And what I was really looking for was very practical, short-term things we can do, such as a property tax holiday for small businesses, things like that, um, to really move forward. And I didn't see any of it. Let me end on this. What what happens Wednesday? Like, you're just going to live with whatever you get. So what, what happens for you Wednesday? Well, today I'm wearing red. Go Flames, go. <laughs> yeah, I'm ignoring this but for the record. Normally, normally I wear purple. And the reason I wear purple is because it's red and blue. I haven't figured out how to get orange in there. I like your uh, scarf. You yeah, managed to get everything yeah. in there. But um, I've had five premiers since I've been mayor. And I get to work with anybody because my, ho- my only horse is Calgary. And so Wednesday morning, I go back to the books, read their platforms, and figure out how to help them make Calgary better. So 28 days of campaigning all comes down to tomorrow and in a new twist, perhaps to the day after, too, because of changes to how advanced voting works here. Hundreds of thousands of ballots won't actually be counted until Wednesday. Advanced voter turnout in this election wasn't just high. It was, in fact, record-breaking. An estimated 696,000 ballots were cast, almost triple the number from the last provincial election. About a third used the new Vote Anywhere rule, which let them vote outside their own riding. Think students or workers in the Alberta oil fields. But those 223,000 ballots won't start being counted until Wednesday, and it could potentially take days, which means some tight races, might not even have a winner tomorrow night. Those who didn't vote in advance may still be deciding just who to support before they head to the polling station tomorrow. Just ahead, my conversation with three undecided voters. What issues they're concerned about, that's coming up. Right now, we're live on The National, and we have the latest on what the RCMP is calling a dark day for Penticton. Four people were shot and killed in the British Columbia city today, and while the suspect turned himself in, police say they still aren't sure what the motive was. Greg Rasmussen has our story. It was a terrifying day for many in the town, including Mark Johnstone. I woke up this morning to uh, three distinct gunshot sounds, bam, bam, bam. Police were scrambling, telling everyone to get off the streets. Donnie Heron didn't know what was going on. Well, what's going on here, you know? Like, we, you know, is this guy on the loose and is he just like shooting randomly? You don't know, right? So It all started around 10.30 this morning with frantic calls to police about a gunman. Shots were first reported near the centre of the city. A man's body was found there. As police were searching, reports came in of more gunfire in a suburb to the south. Three more people were found dead in two neighbouring houses. In all, two men and two women were killed. Just 15 minutes later, a car pulled into the local RCMP detachment. The suspect, a man in his 60s, turned himself in at the front desk. Police say they're certain the shooter knew the people he killed. He said it's very targeted. It, it, there's, we don't know the motive behind it all at this point, but we do know that it was someone, all of the individuals were known to each other. So in, in that regard, we want to ensure, assure the public that they're it's not random. Extra officers have been called in, piecing together what happened. Well, Residents are murders, stunned. And, and it's, it's crazy. You know, there's a lot of little kids that live around here, and, and hopefully it's, that's done. And it's... For years, Penticton has been known as a laid-back vacation spot. Now it's struggling to absorb the shock of so much sudden violence. Rick Rasmussen, CBC News, Vancouver. Police in Mississauga, just west of Toronto, have released dramatic news surveillance video. They are searching for this man. They say he posed as a delivery man and shot a woman with a crossbow. The 44-year-old victim suffered life-threatening injuries but has survived. Comments that were made to the victim by the suspect indicate that the victim was targeted and that the suspect may have carried out the attack at the request of another individual. Authorities say the weapon is usually used for hunting, designed to inflict the maximum amount of damage. The man fled the scene in a pickup truck. Ahead on The National, we head back here to Calgary to sit down with some voters who have struggled to make a decision as they get ready to cast their ballot. First, though, Donald Trump is being accused of inciting violence as his new political target receives death threats. 
and we'll look at the push to put an age limit on pressing the like button on social media. Social media is just honestly like destroying people's mental health, especially kids. Ilhan Omar is hardly a household name for most Americans, but the U.S. president seems determined to change that, repeatedly singling out the controversial Muslim congresswoman on Twitter. Democrats say the attacks are fanning anti-Muslim sentiments. Omar says she's getting death threats, but as Paul Hunter tells us, Trump isn't backing off. Does not represent Minnesota, does she? And so it is. The United States yet again grows ever more divided. This time over Ilhan Omar, a Somali American and U.S. Congresswoman who's Muslim. She is just uh, attacking President Trump. She needs a back down. What is her agenda? It's all about a speech by Omar last month to the Council on American Islamic Relations, or CARE. In it, she noted too many Muslims in America are ill-treated because of their religion. While referencing the 9-11 attackers, CARE, she said. They recognize that some people did something and that all of us were starting to lose access to our civil liberties. Branding her dismissive of 9-11, Republicans jumped on the phrase, some people did something. Here's the front page of the New York Post. But Omar underlined her point was that Muslim Americans must be treated as equals. I took an oath to uphold the Constitution. I am as American as everyone else is. Ratcheting the debate, this tweet by the president, linking her comments with those images and the phrase, oh we will never forget. Says Omar, death threats, citing Donald Trump's words, have followed. Today, Trump called her an out-of-control, ungrateful author of hate statements. Say Democrats... It's not only inspiring death threats against her, but it's deepening the sort of uh, uh, worst types of... Uh, uh, just just uh, the worst streams in our country of, of hatred and bigotry. Not far from those demonstrators backing Trump on this today, others who made clear they stand with the congresswoman. A noisy stare-down. While on Capitol Hill today, security was stepped up for Omar. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. And next on The National, we'll be back with more from Calgary. I'll sit down with three voters with three very different political backgrounds to talk about what they want to see from Alberta's next government. Everybody was working on the economy. Everybody yeah, is working like, on the pipelines. We are all united in yes, this problem, and we need We all want jobs, market jobs, access. Jobs, and we yes. all want everyone to be doing well. We must have leadership that will stand up with uh, strength and clarity to defend jobs. I make this promise to all Calgarians and to all Albertans. I will fight for you. The final push in Alberta today to get voters on side and to the ballot boxes. Tomorrow, people here choose their next premier and government. Will it be four more years of Rachel Notley's NDP? Or will voters pick the United Conservative Party? For a lot of people, that choice is about one big issue, the economy. It is struggling in Alberta, but trying to decide whose approach is best to fix it isn't easy. I sat down with three voters struggling to decide, to talk about their hopes for the future and their messages to the rest of Canada. My name is Stephen Carlton, and I'm 56 years old. There we go. I've been an Albertan for over 30 years. My hope for the future is that we have a government that restores global investor confidence in the province. And at the same time, I would like a government that respects and looks after the well-being of its most vulnerable citizens. I'm Tamara Keller and I am 44 years old. I have lived in Alberta for just over 12 years. My hope for the future of Alberta is that we really come together and we all work together as an inclusive society that everybody can feel safe and valued in. Ready? Okay, go. My name is James Vai, I'm 27, and I've lived in Alberta all my life. Woo! 
My hope for the future of Alberta is it is economically diverse, okay. socially diverse, and remains one of the best places to live in Canada. Thank you all for coming. Thanks for having me. So we, we are, you know, days out now. Would you agree that it's been fairly ugly and divisive? Not at all what I expect from no. professional politicians. Should come to Ottawa. <laughs> but but the, it seems to me that the anxiety out here um, has has been or is about the economy. Jason Kenney doesn't have this magic wand where he's going to come in and wave it and then oil is just going to be back at $100 again. Everybody was working on the economy. Everybody yeah, is working like, on the pipelines. We are all united in yes, this problem, so we need We all want jobs, market jobs, access. Jobs, and yes. we all want everyone to be doing well, yeah. right? Rachel Notley took a different approach, and you know I think she should be commended for that, for you know taking a different stance on things. It, doesn't look like it's worked out, but she should be commended for trying at least. And, and Stephen, you were laid off actually from yes. the oil and gas sector. Yeah, it's so, been almost a year. Yeah. So that must be a huge motivating factor of what's happening in that sector, what's happening to you personally, economically, all those Well, things, yeah. the, the layoff is very personal, but, but uh, I have to look at what's happened in this province and in this country over the last decade. And this has been 10 years of self-inflicted pain on the energy industry. It's been incompetence at the at uh, both the federal and the provincial government level that, um, you know, we didn't get a pipeline built in the last 10 years. So. And, and so the, the fact that the federal government has purchased a pipeline, that they are going through the consultations, where, where does that, because, you know, in Ottawa, the rest of Canada, we see that as like, wow, that's a big gift we all bought you. <laughs> it, 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 is a very, it is a very big yeah, gift, yeah. but when we, we, we look and say, okay, how do we get up how do we get past the walls that are put up around Alberta? How do we get past that? Alberta's not going to do that by itself. It's got to be something that we do with, with the nation. Trans Mountain was something, yes, uh, you know, and, and if the solution is that, that Trans Mountain becomes an Aboriginal owned pipeline, everybody's great with that. That's a fantastic solution. James, you look like you wanted to say something. Um, I I'd really like to see uh, a diverse, diversification of the economy because we have so many talented people in Alberta. We have that entrepreneurial spirit, right? Really, and I think we really could tap into that base, especially here in Calgary. Vacancy rates are at an all-time low, and you know it's having impacts on you know property tax and the city budgets and everything like that. Like, I can't think of a better place than Alberta and Calgary for a new sector to uh, grow in. Well, isn't that sort of what Jason Kenney is proposing when he wants to dramatically cut the corporate tax? Is, is it that simple? I don't, I don't know. I'm not an economist. Have we, seen, have we seen that work? Like, I think we are seeing economists say that that isn't going to deliver the number of jobs that Jason Kenney claims it's going to deliver, and it isn't going to be the, the silver bullet to solve our issues either. So. But no one's going to be that silver bullet, right? I mean, you're, you're taking a leap of faith with whoever you choose. Yeah. So what do you think is going to change then after Tuesday? What would be the thing you would hope would change? One thing that, uh, that if a UCP government comes in, we're expecting the red tape and the bureaucracy to be cut particularly in the energy industry operations, it's very difficult to get anything done now. I mean, what I'd like to see after Tuesday is whoever wins, uh, you know, really take a step towards uniting Albertans and focusing us on a common goal. Well, I, I'd like to see, you know, some unity within Alberta, and I think that having conversations with folks that are maybe on different ends of the spectrum and have respectful conversations is important. But I also think that Alberta needs to really, as a whole, nurture its relationship with the rest of Canada and looking at a global scale as well. And I don't think that coming out of Tuesday and having this adversarial stance on everything and a, you know some, some ultimatums, if you don't do this, then we're going to do that, I don't think that's helpful for Alberta or Canada as well. Well, I, I wondered that because it's almost like it's been a contest to who can stand up to Justin Trudeau the best or be the toughest. But I wonder how helpful that is for Alberta to be in an us versus them sort of position and whether that's something you guys think about here. It, I don't think in the long run that it is a positive thing for Alberta or for Canada. It's great in the short term for, for getting votes, right? But if, you, if you're <laughs> trying to, to have, win an election. <laughs> yeah, like if you're, if you're campaigning on something, it's great, you know, get the, get the base riled up. But in the long term, like, who wants to talk to someone like that. I, I agree with James. It's going to be really interesting to see how we pull all of this together, how we pull our own legislature together, and how we pull the relationship with Canada together. And it's going to be really interesting to see the, the victory and the concession speeches on, on Tuesday to see how they start doing that. Yeah. 
what would you say to, to the rest of Canada as we watch what you guys decide to do on Tuesday? It's a, it's a complicated answer, but it comes down to, are we one Canada? Are we pulling together on this? Are we looking out for everybody's interests? Mm -hmm. um, you know, anybody that's criticizing Alberta for a climate record or, or an environmental record, they, they have to know that, that, that this is some of the cleanest, most ethically produced energy in the world, and the world is not, is not using less energy. It's solar and wind and oil and gas and nuclear. You know, Alberta is going to have a lot to contribute to the bottom line of Canada for decades to come. I think Canadians and Albertans, I think, need to realize whichever way we end up voting, um, know that Alberta as a whole, we are all supportive of our oil and gas industry, no matter who we vote for. Living in Alberta all my life, a lot of the times you forget about how good things are. I just want people to, you know, just to read up and do their research and, and really understand what it is Alberta has to offer, because it's a wonderful place. And it's still one of the best places in the world to live, even after four years of Rachel Notley. Yeah. <laughs> And even after Tuesday, it still will be, right? The world is not going to end on Tuesday, regardless of the results. Yeah. Okay, well, good luck, sort of, I guess, on Tuesday. Yeah. And I hope mostly that Wednesday you wake up and you feel good about things. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, Thank good you. to meet Thanks. you all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So, Rosemary, what's your sense of, of how people got to their decision? They, they seem to be struggling. Yeah, they really, they really did seem to struggle over the period of this campaign. And I would say, Ian, that the, the sort of ugliness of the campaign certainly didn't help matters either. Um, so really, I mean, while polls show one thing tomorrow, we'll, we'll have to wait and see because I think people had a lot to consider this time around. And we will, of course, be here from Alberta tomorrow. We will bring you the results from this province, talk about what has impacted this province over the past number of weeks, its relationship with Ottawa, a big factor as well. The National will be on at 9 Eastern on CBC News Network and on CBC Gem and of course right after Hockey Night in Canada on CBC TV. And of course you can watch all the results come in live. Our election special Alberta Vote starts at 10 p.m. Eastern, 8 Mountain. That will be on CBC News Network and CBC Television here in Alberta. Ahead tonight on The National, our moment is a spontaneous and emotional time in Paris as crowds washed in shock as Notre Dame burned. First, though, why the British government is looking at banning anyone under the age of 18 from hitting the like button. It just comes down to popularity and, and uh, am I worthy uh, based on, you know, what people have reacted or how they've reacted to my post. We are live here on The National. In Paris, firefighters continue to spray down what's left of Notre Dame Cathedral after that huge fire down the spire and part of the roof. Firefighters did manage to contain the blaze and save the main structure, the French president vowing to rebuild. Late tonight, the mayor of Paris shared this photo of some of the historic artifacts rescued from the flames, including the crown of thorns said to have been worn by Jesus Christ. The Mueller report will be released to Congress and the public on Thursday. It is expected, though, to be heavily redacted. The report was finished last month. The Attorney General, William Barr, released his conclusions, saying that there was no collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia during the 2016 election. In 74, and oh, he went right at him. Cross-check right to the face, and he's gone. Well, because of that cross-check to the face, Toronto's Nazem Kadri will miss the rest of the Leafs' playoff series against the Boston Bruins. The NHL says it suspended the forward for intentionally targeting Jake DeBrusque's head during the game on Saturday. The league says it was a retaliatory hit, and they took Kadri's disciplinary record into account, his fifth suspension since 2013. But without him tonight, the Leafs managed to beat the Bruins in Game 3. They now lead that series 2-1. Videos that play automatically before you have a chance to say no. Likes on Facebook that give you a satisfying hit of self-worth. These are features carefully designed to keep you on apps, more often for longer. And research shows that children are especially susceptible. It's why the British government is proposing new rules for social media platforms, including banning seductive features, like those Facebook likes for users under the age of 18. Some experts cheer the proposals, but as Cam McIntosh explains, it is easier said than done. 
you want to talk to Ian Crook, don't call, don't text. Just snap him. What do you use Snapchat for? Uh, talking to people, you know, just snapping people. A lot of it isn't just, it's not even conversations. It's yep. just stupid snap streaks. A streak is kind of like a game. Keep a Snapchat conversation going, get recognized. Everyone's just trying to get like 200, 500 and go on like that. And if you miss one day, it's gone forever. So it's like there's a big incentive. Keeping up, it's that incentive that keeps him on the app. Even if counterintuitively for a high school student, he supports restricting the feature. I think that's a good idea because honestly, like social media is just honestly like destroying people's mental health, especially kids. The gratification of those streaks, Facebook and Instagram likes, doesn't only have Britain's privacy regulator concerned. Canadian mental health advocates say social lives on social media have become high pressure. It just comes down to popularity and, and uh, am I worthy uh, based on, you know, what people have reacted or how they've reacted to my posts. Right now, the Canadian government is not exploring similar restrictions. It's not clear how you would enforce an age restriction. Experts say it could require more data and possibly be more invasive. I think that uh, another question to ask is how the back end will be regulated, so how the analytics of the platform will be uh, uh, regulated. You want a cookie with that? This episode of the British Netflix series Black Mirror takes it all to an extreme point. Virtual responses to each physical interaction. Not quite high school, but at times it might not feel all that far off. At the same time, like, there are different ways to communicate that are more, like, genuine. For now, almost everyone seems glued to their screens. That's really why I have it, to keep in touch with some people. One snap at a time. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. If social media is one battleground for the hearts and minds of kids and teens, then the sex ed classroom is another. At a time when society grapples with ways to stop gender-based violence, this past winter, Nick Purden went to an Ottawa high school to follow a workshop on sexual consent. Here's another look at what he found. Okay, well, welcome guys. My name is Matt. I work with the Ottawa Coalition to End Violence Against Women. Here's what a sex ed workshop looks like. I've been allowed to sit in as students from A.Y. Jackson High School in okay. Ottawa learn about consent. Do you have a sense of what some of the women who go to the school have done today to prevent themselves from being sexually assaulted? Uh, maybe this morning they put thought into what they were going to wear. They definitely um, sometimes take a car instead of walking because they don't feel safe walking. And, um, yeah. And there's a reason for that. So some of the things that I hear people say is, when I walk to my car at night, I carry my keys as a weapon. I won't rent an apartment on the first floor. If I'm at a party or at the bar, I would only go with friends. I would never go alone. And I would never leave alone. Most of the violence that women report, it's men who are doing the harm. Why is that? But why is so much of it coming from guys? Matt Chap has spent most of his adult life trying to end violence against women. Here in Ottawa over the last few years, he's given this workshop to about 4,000 people. Uh, there's a lot of pressures that we're under to, maybe without realizing it, do harm to other people. The students here want to end the violence too. That's why they invited Matt to talk to their men's leadership group they call Man Up. Amir Shukla explains what being part of Man Up has done for him. I think it's really made me see a little bit more through um, a woman's eyes. Um, like another interesting point is like... Adam Telfer says every member of the group is committed to standing up to any kind of violence they witness at their school. Coming into grade nine, I didn't realize rape and stuff like this was such a big deal until you actually sit down and realize like this is happening everywhere and this needs to be stopped. This is based on research and conversations that I've had with people who've been in the situation or whose friends have been in the situation. In giving these workshops, Matt has talked to hundreds of men in the last few years. Like, doesn't it feel like the stakes are high sometimes? I guess so. And they tell him some of the challenges they face. I sometimes hear from guys that um, gender roles are changing, uh, people used to know how to behave, now it's all up for grabs, um, it's confusing to be a man. I don't know what women want. I feel like I'm walking on eggshells. All right, so we're gonna switch and look at the other scenario as well. Okay. Matt hopes workshops like this one can help men clear up some of their confusion on how to behave in a relationship. 
And the stakes are high when you consider that most sexual violence is committed by someone the victim is close to. You are close uh, friends with Stephanie. That's what the next scenario is all about. She tells you that her boyfriend, Emmanuel, has been telling her it's time to start having sex because they've been together six, for six months. He buys her flowers every month and gives her lots of gifts. Some of her friends ask when she's going to sleep with him. I feel like he's also building up like a sense of like guilt for her, right? Because he's doing these nice things for her because he's trying to get something out of her, right? For him, in that situation, he has power over her. Um, all her friends are on his side saying that they should, uh, she should sleep with him. So this exercise sensitizes us to the kinds of pressures that women feel. Even I could ask in the nicest way, she's still going to feel this pressure. She might actually feel like it's safer just to go along with it. That's what I hear people say, is it's safer to go along with it. And here's the thing, the pressure teenage boys feel to have sex is part of the problem. If you've been in a relationship for a long time, it's kind of expected that you'd start doing things sexually and you're kind of weird if you're not. Mm -hmm. I think what is really hard for a lot of the teenage guys now is knowing what is right and what is wrong to do. What's that like for you? It's, it's difficult. It's, I really think our generation is going to be the generation of change and I think that puts us in an extremely difficult role because we have to be the ones who define those lines. Which lines? The lines that you can't cross. All right, guys, here's how it works. It's Matt says if you're going to know those limits, so you have to get better at communicating with your partner. That's what the next exercise is all about. These are cards that other students have created that are like things they would say or do to check if they're what their partner's into. <laughs> what do you want me to do to you? <laughs> Realistic or not? For me, that's not something realistically I'd say. I'd probably go more with like, what are you into? Can I put my wand in your chamber of secrets? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Of course, it's easy to make all the right choices and decisions when you're with your friends. And so as the workshop comes to an end, Matt challenges the group. I think we all know what's the right thing to say in this room, right? We know the kind of guys we want to be. We know what our highest values are. Like, we know what we should be doing. But real life's messier than that. And I think the strength of your group is that you, you have each other. That's really powerful. That's a great There's no denying there's a will here to change things. And if we're going to solve violence against women, that's not a bad place to start. <laughs> Nick Purden, CBC News, Ottawa. The Moment is next on The National. Tonight, we'll hear from Parisians united in grief after flames gutted Notre Dame. I haven't seen the streets this crowded since the World Cup in last summer when France won. However, the mood is much different, much more somber. Parisians in shock as fire engulfed a piece of that city's history, and they kept watch late into the night, standing together as close as they could to the Notre Dame Cathedral. But they weren't just watching, they were moved to sing and to pray. Their outpouring of grief is tonight's moment. Lots of people are gathered to watch as this heartbreaking event happens. The spirits are very low here. People are kind of shocked still. It's been quite a few hours since I've been here. I haven't seen the streets this crowded since the World Cup. However, the mood is much different, much more somber. There's a choir here that's really interesting. They've been singing um, for quite a while now. Very eerie. We're all very sad that this is happening. Of course, Ian, I mean, everyone watching that with the same sort of feeling today, just overwhelming sadness, like a strange attachment to a monument in another city, um, but one that feels really close. I mean, I've been there, other people have been there, and it was really very sad to see, although seeing the so shots of the inside, what has been mm -hmm. preserved, um, was a bit of a relief that there's so much there that's still left, too.
And, and regardless of people's religious beliefs, if they're religious at all, there is something yeah. about hymns, about religious music that is stirring, that is moving, that is solemn. And in the context there, spontaneously singing outside, uh, it, it certainly was moving to listen to even from here. That is The National for April the 15th. Good night.